You have seduced me, Lord, and I have let myself be seduced. These are the words of the prophet Jeremiah in the first reading today. In fact, another translation uh, has the word seduced as deceived. So what Jeremiah could be saying is, Lord, you have deceived me, and I have let myself be deceived. Does the Lord deceive, or perhaps is it something uh, that Jeremiah is coming to understand about the true ways of the Lord? Think about when the prophet Jeremiah lived, probably in the 6th century uh, before Christ. So we'd had the glories of the kingdom of Israel, we'd had the liberation from Egypt, where God made his promises of a land of milk and honey to his people. And for the people of Israel, the people of God, they associated God's blessings with prosperity, with land, and all those things that come with what we would consider to be a good, comfortable life. And yet the prophet Jeremiah is called to preach the word of God, that fire in his bones, in a time when all of that is gone. The lands of the kingdom of Israel have been invaded, they've been dispersed, Israel is in exile, they have no access to the temple. It would seem that all the promises of God have actually gone unfulfilled, or they've been broken. And yet Jeremiah still feels called to preach this word of God, to call people back to the covenant promises. But no wonder, in his darker moments, he says to the Lord, Lord, you've seduced me. I've been deceived. I was called to preach this word. But where, are, where is the delivery on the promise? Now, at the time, the people of Israel uh, had a very uh, vague concept of life after death. You went, you died, and you went down to the underworld, to Sheol. Not hell, something different. And what was bad about Sheol, about death, was that in that place, you could no longer praise God. So a long life was a sign of prosperity. But it was also in about this time, when the people of Israel were suffering, they began to wonder, is God fulfilling his promises in a different way? Or in a new way? A way we couldn't possibly have imagined? Did we misunderstand the Lord when he talked about a land of milk and honey? Is it something more than something we can just achieve on this earth? And so the idea, the belief in heaven came to pass, or it grew out of the faith of the people of Israel. Jesus speaks into that. Jesus is the fulfilment of that desire. It's why the prophet Jeremiah couldn't turn away. Even though he'd seen broken promises all around, every time he went to turn away from the Lord God, something inside him says, no, turn back. There's something more. There's something deeper to my words, something beyond the pleasures of this life. And so Jeremiah continued in his mission, even though he did not see the promise fulfilled in his own life. Jesus faces a similar temptation as Jeremiah. Would you believe it? Even Jesus. We've seen it in the desert when he goes to be tempted by the devil. And what does the devil promise? Earthly prosperity, wealth power, the fulfilment of all his goals, or at least what would seem to be the goals of a worldly Messiah. And Jesus rejects them all, because his kingdom is not of this world, but of the heavenly fathers, the kingdom of heaven. And that's where he's going to lead us. And in today's gospel, he comes up against that great temptation. Because Peter, so great last week, having heard that word of God and having blurted out, you are the Christ shows his misunderstanding, shows that his understanding of the Christ and the Messiah is something from the olden days. Because when Jesus proclaims the resurrection, when Jesus says he must die before he rises again, the foundation, the fundamental of our faith, Peter goes, no way. This is not the plan. The land of milk and honey, that's our plan, remember? And what does Jesus say? He doesn't just say, oh no, Peter, you've misunderstood. He says, get behind me, Satan. That's the level of resistance Jesus has to Peter's idea of the fulfilment of the promises. Jesus proclaims here his death and resurrection for a greater purpose than just delivering the things of life which will make us comfortable and will bring us happenstance happiness. He's proclaiming a joy which leads us through the darkness of poverty, of conflict, of 
bad times in our, in our relationships, with financial difficulties, all those things that we are going through that lead us through the darkness into a greater light, into a greater hope, the kingdom of heaven. And so he resists Peter forcefully. He's showing Peter what it is to be a disciple, a follower of Jesus. A follower of Jesus isn't just someone who comes to Mass and says they believe. The follower of Jesus walks the path that Jesus walked. That's why he says after this, anyone who does not take up his cross and follow me cannot be my disciple. That's the cost of discipleship, but it's also the reward. Our life in Jesus Christ is not for this life only. It's for eternity. But in order to live that life, we have to tread the same path that Jesus trod. Do you remember last week I said Jesus is going to lead us into those dark places of our lives, of our sin, of our own problems, of those things we don't even want to face ourselves. But why? Why does he want to inhabit those? So as to bring us to the joy the everlasting joy of the resurrection to make us as it was said in the gospel today and in the in the second reading perfect whole complete he wants to occupy every part of our lives but he wants to take us with him so that as we see him we see ourselves and know who we really are who we are called to be to be a disciple of jesus isn't easy <clears throat> But it is joyful if we stick with Christ to the very end. If in our darkest moments we still turn towards him like Prophet Jeremiah. It's not a sin in prayer or in other times to remonstrate with God and say, Lord, what's going on in my life? Why are things so difficult? I don't understand your ways. We see Jeremiah doing it in today's first reading. And yet he turns towards the Lord. He is renewed and strengthened. We see Jesus suffer these temptations. We see Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane actually ask the Father to spare him his destiny because he was afraid of the human pain. If Jesus can do it, surely we can. That's an honest relationship with the Heavenly Father. We're not being spared the difficulties of life just before we're, because we're Christians. Rather, we are chosen for the difficulties of life to show our brothers and sisters Actually, there is more to life than ease and pleasure and wealth. Actually, there's much more to life. There is sacrifice. There is love. All born through the new mind that St. Paul talks of. The logic of the cross. The logic of discipleship. Which says, in self-sacrificing love, in giving ourselves completely to God and to our brothers and sisters, we discover the true secret of life. We discover the kingdom of heaven. We discover joy that isn't passing or fleeting, but is everlasting. But it is a challenge. So let's do what Jesus did. Let's imitate his own practice in life. Jesus loved the world. He loved his brothers and sisters. He loved his community and he spent lots of time with them, among people. But note also what he did at the beginning of his ministry. As I've said, he went into the desert to spend time with his heavenly father. He often withdrew from the community life, from the people who were around him, to pray, to commune with his heavenly father, so he could step back and then step back in renewed. We're called to spend that time daily with our heavenly father, with the son, and to ask for the grace of the Holy Spirit, so that we may be reinserted into life, so that the joy of the resurrection may be seen in us and in the way we love our brothers and sisters. But the joy of the resurrection can only be seen and can only be experienced in us and through us if we are living the life of discipleship, which is the life of the cross. Amen. Amen.